Winston Churchill famously commented about the Battle of Anzio that, I had hoped that we were hurling a wildcat onto the shore, but all we got was a stranded whale. At Anzio, thousands of Allied troops became stuck in a narrow bridgehead for months, instead of advancing quickly as envisioned. One of the most unique units of World War II fought at Anzio. This mixed American-Canadian unit was officially known as the First Special Service Force. I'll be calling it the Force, just like the unit called themselves, for this video. They fought across the world during the war. They landed at Kiska on the Aleutian Islands in August 1943, fought in Italy from November 43 onwards, fought at Anzio and advanced into Rome during the winter and spring of 1944, and landed in southern France during Operation Dragoon in August 1944. The unit was disbanded in France in December of that same year. The force gained their legendary status at Anzio. It was there that they became known as the Devil's Brigade. We will be looking at one day where the force fought at Anzio, February 14th, 1944. This day wasn't a romantic one for the force. It was a normal one for the unit on the front lines at Anzio, but an important one in securing their legacy. I want to dig down as far as possible about this day and show what the force did and what they encountered in the Anzio bridgehead. This was not the glamorous work of advances and breakouts. This was the daily grind of patrols for intelligence gathering and engaging in small firefights with the enemy. There were many days like this for the force at Anzio, but this one stands out for a reason that will be discussed at the end of the video. The force arrived in the Anzio bridgehead on February 1st, 1944. They quickly took up positions on the southern side of the beachhead near the Mussolini Canal. The canal formed the front line for the force, but as we will see, they were not content with just staying on their side of the line. Allied offensives had been launched at the time the force arrived at Anzio. These offensives pushed into the central sector and created a salient in the Allied lines. They also ran headlong into the Germans, who were preparing their own offensive. The Germans counterattacked and removed the salient. Another German counterattack followed, but it took place after the 14th, so we will not be discussing it here. Despite all this fighting, by mid-February, the situation for the Allies and the Anzio bridgehead was relatively stable. The stranded whale that was the Allies led to the force conducting patrol after patrol toward the German lines to the south of Anzio. They took an aggressive stance toward the Germans, as we'll see from their war diary. War diary entry for February 14th is rather nonchalant about the events of the day. Clear and cold, heavy frost again, but quite warm the middle of the day. About 80 more officers and men arrived from hospitals in Naples area. Some, 51, arrived yesterday and stayed at the troop assembly area at night. All went forward this evening. Casualties at the front continue. Some must be left in enemy territory when patrols hit too heavy opposition. Our bombing of enemy installations continues, usually in groups of 12 medium bombers. German AA anti-aircraft fire is accurate and seems to get one out of each attack. A few of the crew bail out. Our own AA picks off the odd German raider. The situation is generally unchanged and satisfactory, but everyone is issued with three days emergency rations. Two of K, one of D, just in case. Combat echelon sent out night patrols. Third regiment patrol clashed with the enemy, killing 10 for loss of one. Our diary also contains a map trace of the events of February 14th, as well as a report on the day. These are the key documents we will be using to look at the experience of the force at Anzio. I'll link the force war diary in the description, so you can check out the documents yourself if you are interested. To better understand the events recorded on the trace, I put the maps found in the war diary together like this. This was done just like they would have done at the headquarters to get a better understanding of the situation they were in. The trace covers two different maps, thus why I needed to combine them together for the trace to make sense. Also, an S2 report, the area for intelligence, of the 14th will be used to better understand the events marked on the trace. A general summary of the day was given in the S2 report. It states, enemy continued to hold a defensive posture in the sector. Small fueler patrols along the front were repulsed without difficulty. Enemy's latest tactic is to ambush or flank our own patrols by counter-reconnaissance action ahead of its own lines. At end of period, two enemy tanks were reported forward of 3rd Regiment positions. Artillery was scattered and harassing throughout period. The report then goes on to outline several different events taking place on the 14th. I've broken the entries in the report into nine events. We'll be talking about all of them individually. 
We'll look at them with the trace and without it on the map. Here's the maps with the events charted. The black mark at the top of the map indicates where the force's boundary was in the Anzio perimeter. And here is the same map with the Mussolini Canal highlighted so you can see where the force's front line was on the 14th. And here's the trace over the map. First event took place at 0215 near Borgo Sabatino where the Mussolini Canal empties into the sea. When an enemy patrol of approximately one squad attempted to infiltrate through the OPL, which is the outpost line, the entry reads, our outpost fired on enemy with MG machine gun and rifle receiving MG rifle grenade and rifle fire in return. By 0300, patrol was driven off. Next event took place much further to the north, to just outside the village of Borgo Pajora, where the war diary noted, Our patrols were active during early morning of 14 Feb, and reported the following observations. MP and rifle fire received from the enemy. One enemy killed in brief firefight, unable to get identifications from body due to covering MP fire. The third event took place not far from where the second event happened. This event shows the meticulous detail and reporting that was carried out by the force on their patrols. The word diary simply reads, Patrol reported a tracked vehicle believed to be a tank laying on its side. This shows that their patrols very much paid attention to any small details that they could report back to the intelligence section to get the most of the patrols they were partaking in towards the enemy lines. Such observation skills were stressed in their training, and these reports show that it had paid off. The next four events are along similar lines to what was observed in Event 3. Event 4 reports that enemy were seen working on a vehicle, but the patrol was unable to close with them due to the enemy illuminating the area with flares. Also, unexplained explosions were noted down. Event 5 is a patrol observing mortar fire that also received machine gun and rifle fire from the enemy. Event 6 just notes that abandoned machine gun ammunition was found near some unoccupied foxholes hidden in some brush. Event 7 notes that something that sounded like a two-cylinder motor, such as from a motorcycle, was heard in the area of their patrol. Event 8 is the first use of friendly artillery to hit back at the enemy. The word diary stated, enemy activity was observed around a haystack. Artillery fire was laid on this position with good results. This must mean that the position was made unusable for the enemy, or that they saw the enemy retreating from it. The last event covered here, event number 9, is one of the most in-depth reports and the intelligence report for the day. It is actually made up of three smaller events that we will detail with a reading from the War Diary. The War Diary states, A combat patrol from 3rd Regiment followed route moving east, about 100 yards to the north, to where trenches were found and some enemy ran from area to trucks parked on road, driving away before patrol could fire on them. Patrol continued north to the quarry and were fired upon by enemy using an American BAR. In the firefight that followed, 10 enemy were killed with a loss of one man to our patrol. Patrol withdrew after enemy illuminated area with flares. This was a typical day for the force as it held the line near the Mussolini Canal on the Anzio perimeter. Events such as patrols, making contact with the enemy, and providing intelligence went on for many, many weeks until the breakout happened and the push to Rome in May 1944, with Rome being captured on June 4th, 1944, with the force leading the way. Another event that is said to have happened on the 14th, and why I chose this day to cover, along with the excellent trace that I found in the war diary, has to do with the legacy of the force and how they came to get their nickname. The Black Devils, or the Devil's Brigade, as they were nicknamed, supposedly came from the Germans. A passage from a captured war diary is said to be the inspiration for the name. A translation of the diary of one Lieutenant Heinz Mueller, an officer in charge of an assaulting platoon in the Hermann Goring Division, is included in the February 1944 war diary. His entry for February 14th reads, Enemy patrols in baggy pants are 100 meters from my own OP line. We don't know where they are or when they come. Seems like black devils are all around. A few have questioned the authenticity of this German's diary. In his book on the force, Kenneth Joyce talks about how he had a conversation with someone within the intelligence section who claims that the force's own intelligence officers 
came up with this story to help improve their morale, which was lagging at the time, to show the impact that they were having on their enemy. I cannot verify by myself that the claim that those who worked in the intelligence section came up with this. As Joyce notes, this was from a phone conversation, and I can't access that. There's no copy of this German's diary within the word diary of the unit. I've seen other captured documents included, along with their translation. This one only includes the translation. There is some room for doubt about the authenticity of said diary. However, this name has stuck throughout history, and many still call the forest by this name today. Daily entries for the Forces War Diary for February 44 ends with the following passage. A portion of the Mussolini Canal, which the force holds, is 11,000 meters long, which for our American friends is almost seven miles. The diary continues. This is very close to being one-fourth of the total front of the bridgehead. It's a very thin line to hold with 1,296 officers and men. We have maintained the initiative by active patrolling all along the front. The 1st Battalion, 3rd Regiment repulsed two very strong enemy attacks. Our orders are to hold the canal. We have not enough strength to push past it and have to hold it by sitting on it and patrolling to the front. The enemy has high ground all around the bridgehead and can see all our ground, shell all our roads from at least two sides. The boys have done a wonderful job. Despite the legends of the force at Anzio, they were misused in this role in the fighting in the bridgehead. They had received specialized training in things like parachuting and field craft, and yet were used to simply hold a chunk of line within the perimeter. They performed the role of holding the line well because of their skills, but they would have been better used elsewhere or waited for further action somewhere else in Italy. February 14, 1944, showed the skill and tenacity of the force, but these skills could have been better used elsewhere.